new edition of our show. My name is Business and as you always say, um, business means a lot of money, stability and business investment, of course, uh, mean uh, a lot of money. Uh, we're here talking about uh, um, a lot, actually, but we have a main issue, the new Suez Canal and uh, uh, the Belt One, uh, one Belt One Road, uh, what it is, what it means to us, uh, what it means to, uh, uh, what it means generally, and a lot more than that. Uh, also, that... Um, um, Within the framework of uh, Share Egypt uh, uh, Promotes Initiative, uh, the Ministry of uh, International Cooperation has received a number of comments over an essay written by a Minister of International <coughs> Cooperation, uh, Mr. Sahar Nasr, under the title Egypt Draws New Economic Path, which was established uh, in the Wall Street Journal newspaper. The comments uh, hailed Nasr's keenness to address the international media to unveil the real image of the Egyptian economy. As the Minister stressed, uh, the uh, that the government's main target is to regain stability out uh, of uh, the ailed economy and realize an integrated uh, sustainable development after years of economic instability following the January 2011 revolution. Uh, also, uh, Minister of International Cooperation, Dr. Sahar Nasr, met with uh, Lebanon's finance minister, Hassan Khalil, and the economy minister, Alan Hakim, on uh, means of boosting bilateral ties as well as the preparations for holding the upcoming meeting of the joint Egyptian-Lebanese Higher Committee in the first quarter of 2017. Um, a lot more actually. Uh, we have got also um, our guest uh, here talking about uh, developments in the Suez Canal, the mega project. And um, we have with us Mr. Shirin Nagar, member of uh, uh, the um, Shipping uh, uh, Chamber, International Shipping Chamber, uh, chamber um, member. <laughs> Loser. Welcome with us here. Thank you very much. We're going for a short break after we should be back. Uh, we've got interesting footage actually uh, for the Suez Canal and also for the development and also for uh, the what so-called um, the, the crises uh, that are, are man-made here and are just like uh, um, meant to create cr some people creating crises here of uh, uh, lack of sugar, lack of oil and all these things. And we've got interesting, uh, very interesting uh, footage. Uh, stay tuned to us. Don't go away.
Welcome back uh, to Money Means Business. Uh, and we have with us our guest, Ms. Shirin Nagar, member of the International Shipping uh, Chamber. Welcome again, sir, with us. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, what we've been actually uh, watching is an exclusive for uh, our show here. And uh, as you saw, this is one of the storage uh, uh, chambers or stores that were uh, uh, that were um, uh, people were arrested there, and uh, um, that you know tons of sugar was hidden there. Sugar, sugar of the government that they they acquired, and uh, the kilo is for seven pounds, and they just changed the packaging, putting other companies' names, in, and some are not real companies actually, and just uh, selling one kilo for 15 pounds. The same also goes for the oil, uh, uh, taking the label off of uh, the oil, uh, as we saw, the oil uh, uh, bottles and uh, uh, adding, uh, actually replacing them with other uh, names and then selling them with different prices. And at the end, uh, um, what happens is, you know, creation of uh, um, a problem and uh, a crisis of lack of sugar, lack of oil. And so on and so forth to you as, you know, this is the creation of a crisis, actually, and how it goes here. Uh, any, uh, uh, any kind of comments, sir? Well, it's unfortunate what uh, we can say is that uh, I know for a fact that you have imported this uh, month alone uh, almost 200,000 tons of oil, so yeah. that couldn't possibly be a shortage. This is all a, mm -hmm. uh, a self-inflicted uh, crisis, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, unfortunately. So going to the subject, the main subject we're talking about right now, uh, uh, the Suez Canal, uh, the new Suez Canal uh, that was built. And, you know, what we talked about is the one belt, one road. What is it, the one belt, one road? Well, one belt, one road is a concept that has been launched by the Chinese government a few years ago. And it is basically involving one belt, which is going to be a belt, a road belt, a land belt that will uh, uh, connect China with the whole of Europe through road, yes. through, uh, through land. Mm -hmm. And the one road is actually the, um, is actually the um, maritime road. Mm -hmm which uh, if we just get the map we'll get uh, now you know place, the, the, exactly yeah, yes it will be easier to explain yes the idea there is that the chinese would like to have a stronger presence and a more efficient trading pattern between china and europe which is the main consuming uh, market and they would also like to have more uh, influence or more presence i would not say influence but more presence in the middle east and in Africa. Yes. Now, uh, the first person to catch this hint very quickly was actually President Sisi, because um, on his first visit to China, his declaration was that Egypt will support and bless the Silk Route mm -hmm. through the Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the Silk Route, as such, the old Silk Route through mm -hmm. the Suez Canal, is going to be uh, the one pattern. The more important pattern or the more effective pattern will be through uh, another uh, vision altogether, which is uh, going uh, through land and the sea rail uh, concept. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, <coughs> we do have right now, you know, actually the first no, we, uh, one. We no. need to get the first one in. The, the first one, the, yes, yeah, they... we need the first one. Um, uh, actually, uh, how do you see uh, uh, this concept? Uh, how do you view it? Well, the, the, the sea rail concept is uh, a link, actually, which unfortunately we don't have maps uh, to, to explain yeah, here. Yeah. But uh, we the maps, what, we really, what we really would like to see here as a sea rail concept, the sea rail concept is basically a concept that will connect the rail networks mm -hmm. of Europe, with that of Egypt yes. and then through the new um, uh, uh, Gulf uh, uh, Rail. This is the uh, one belt, one uh, road yeah. system. You can see the yellow lines yes. going are, these are the Silk Route, uh, the land bridge on the Silk Route. Yes. And they show you which uh, countries and which capitals this Silk Route is, uh, is targeting oh, okay. as a target market for them, for, yes. for trading. Yes. The blue lines are the maritime routes mm -hmm. that will connect China with India, 
which actually now becomes the spice route rather yeah. than just the silk route because you know India is, is famous for spices and for, for herbs and so on. Yes. So it will be the silk and spice route in that concept. And then going further up, going through the Suez Canal up to uh, the Adriatic port in uh, Venice, mm -hmm. and at the same time going south, going down to Kenya, mm -hmm. it passing through the Suez Canal. Now, by going to Kenya is a diversion of the route itself, but there the Chinese are trying to instate their presence in Africa, which is a massive market, and it's a massive market both as a consumer market as well as a raw material import market, which China is desperately in need of. Mm -hmm. Next slide. If, if yes. Next slide. Uh, yeah, exactly. And we're talking about the, your vision of the whole. Uh, thing. Yeah, the vision. Uh, the vision here is totally. Uh, our vision is different. If if when, when we see the next slide. Yes, we see the next slide. You know, accordingly, we're <coughs> going to be talking about you know, like I'm going right. with the flow. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You, you see, the, the the vision here, or there it is. The, yes. Uh, now you can see the red line that connects between Beijing and uh, Piraeus. Yes. Going through Egypt. It is not a Suez Canal uh, crossing, no. Mm -hmm. This is a um, route that takes you from uh, Beijing across the new uh, uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor yes. into Karachi. Yes. Now, from Karachi, the steaming time between Karachi and Muscat is 24 hours. So a rail ferry is being deployed, or is to be deployed, between mm. um, uh, Karachi and Muscat, and then through Muscat, through the new extensive rail network that is actually under construction at the moment in the entire Gulf area, be it Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, Oman, or whatever, yeah. this can connect all the way up to one of two places in Saudi Arabia, either the port of Jeddah or the new massive and very modern port yeah. of King Abdullah further north of Jeddah, which is about 200 kilometers north of Jeddah. Then another ferry would take the train across from uh, uh, these, uh, either of these two ports into the port of Safaga yeah. or, or into another port but it's, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for, for, for the moment Yes. It take it to Safaga Safaga will trail all the way up to Alexandria mm -hmm. where it can pick up another ferry and go into Piraeus and then connect with the entire European network now here we're not talking about a train coming from uh, Europe all the way down to China and uh, just picking up, um, picking up uh, ferries and, and just, just taking ferry rides. No. Yes, yes. The idea here is that the train operator will have the opportunity to carry cargo between Europe and Egypt and then again from Egypt to uh, the Gulf and then again from the Gulf to Pakistan and then mm. again from Pakistan to uh, uh, India to, to um, China yes and of course vice versa yes so it is it is a good opportunity for a train operator to say as we call in in, in commercial shipping to double dip yeah uh, in every p place he goes and it's a much much more linking a much stronger link mm -hmm. the link does not compete either with the Suez Canal nor does it compete with commercial shipping container shipping yes this is aimed at supporting the fast-moving consumer goods, the time-sensitive cargoes, cargoes that are in need of being delivered there very quickly, yes. but at the same time cannot tolerate the expense of mm -hmm. air freight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, to give you an example, pharmaceuticals... Just time-consuming and expense, you know, consuming, uh, um, expenses also. Uh, I mean, if anything is time-consuming <coughs> or something, they want to just cut that short and, and the, the way short and, of course, not pay that much, which is really great. Exactly. That is the idea. And we're talking here about the, about the transit time about, of approximately 15 to 16 days, whereas if you're talking about a container ship coming from, New, from Northern Europe, you're talking about at least 35 days, maybe even 40 days. Yeah. Because, actually, they make several stops en route. Yes. So this is the idea. Also, the coverage of that concept will uh, create a link. If we can see that map once again. Yes, uh, the same map. The same, no, 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 one, no, the, one no the one before. The one before, yes. Yeah, that's it. Uh, if you look at the old routes, if you can recall the old routes, the old routes are going from the northern part of China, northern part of Europe, passing through the Caucasian countries like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and so on. And this, uh, this route. The always, there's always going to be a link between the land and the and the and the and the, the, the sea rail, yes. the, the the Silk Route and the sea rail route. 
This can give a lot of advantages also to create a bigger potential for trading between these Caucasian, the Caucasian region and the Middle East, where really there's hardly any link if at all, be it by air or be it by sea. Yes, yes, true. Um, well, now we you know, like, uh, what advantages, you know, uh, do we get from uh, this? Uh, what Egypt can offer? Uh, what uh, benefits do we get out of that? Uh, Egypt has got a lot to offer. If I can see the third map, with the, that's the one. This map shows that Egypt has got three uh, major um, uh, spots or major areas mm -hmm. for, for, uh, of development. Yes. The first one being the Suez Canal Economic Zone. Well, we all know about the Suez Canal Economic Zone. It's going to be a multi um, a multi-trade type of operation is going to be industrial, is going to be commercial, is going to be scientific. Yes. And all this is very important for uh, the exports and the imports of the uh, Egyptian economy. Now, if we talk about the second triangle, which is the Safaga, uh, Abu Tartur, uh, Corsair triangle, number two on yes. the map, here you have the mining we call it the golden triangle because uh, it is uh, this area is extremely rich of minerals especially phosphates and if you are talking about phosphate rock or phosphoric acid as an industry this will develop very nicely into places like there are three specialized ports there yes. actually the most specialized of the three is a port called el hamrawe mm -hmm. which is between safaga and al qusair is halfway in between the two this is a specialist port only built to handle phosphate rock. Mm -hmm. Now, to develop a port like this for phosphoric acid, which is an essential uh, component for production of fertilizers as a liquid product, both in India, Pakistan, and in China. So we have a very strong potential here. This is another area yes. uh, Egypt has to offer. The third area that Egypt has to offer is Halayb Shalatin Triangle. Mm -hmm. Now, Halayb Shalatin Triangle is a very promising area. Uh, it is basically virgin. It is a deserted area. There's hardly anybody living mm -hmm. there. And uh, Halayb Shalatin area, I would like to give it another name, but I will leave that until the end of uh, our session, because uh, I feel that I think this is a doable thing. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. Egypt, how, what can Egypt benefit from all this? Now, yes. we have seen what is the world what is the Chinese and the, the, the uh, various um, countries that are being are in route? Mm -hmm. What do they develop? What do they benefit out of this? Well, this is what Egypt has to offer, mm -hmm. and this is what Egypt has to has in, in, in resources, in, uh, in, uh, in, in manpower. Egypt, f first and foremost, has got two major things to offer in, to that project. It's got a consumer market of 92 million people. And it's got a massive labor market of also 92 million people. Mm -hmm. Young, we have a very young, genera a very young population in age, mm -hmm. which is ready and groomed to work and to build up their own country, which I sincerely hope they will eventually manage to do, taking over from us. What does Egypt gain from all this? Other than producing, uh, developing those three major spots, major economic zones, we have <clears throat> two points. First of all, Egypt is exporting cargo through uh, what was signed in, in 2005, uh, what was called the Green Corridor. Yes. The Green Corridor was launched by an Egyptian ta carrier, mm -hmm. and uh, this carrier was nominating a guaranteed transit time of five days from harvest to shelf in Europe. Okay. Um, if you see the amount of expenditure and the amount of exposure that takes place to a certain container, there, uh, every move you make to a unit to a container is a cost item. Okay. You have to reduce your costs in order to become competitive. Yes. So uh, this green corridor can be supported much better. Excellent. Uh, um, can be supported much better 
by a train. Why? Because mm -hmm. the cost elements involved in export through a train are 50% of the cost elements yes. related to the cost of a container. That is number one. Number two, your transit time is much faster. Yeah. If you talk about the container being moved around from Alexandria or Port Said all the way up to Holland or to, um, or let's say, Rotterdam or Antwerp, it has to be shipped back all the way down deep in the heart of Europe. Yes. And the handling is, uh, is very expensive. Whereas if you're coming on a train, you come from Piraeus, you're already linked to the network, the, the European network, and then you can distribute as you go along. Mm -hmm. So that means longer, tra um, uh, shorter transit time. Shorter transit time means immediately longer shelf time. Reduced cost in handling means competitive price on the sales. Yes. So both are benefiting. The Egyptian exporters are benefiting because they are getting longer shelf life of their commodities so they can sell better. They are there when the cargo is still much more fresh in three days than it is after seven days. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they can sell cheaper because their cost in handling and movement has been reduced yes. by 50%, that I would say. Mm -hmm. The second thing, if we look at the imports, imports here we have the map that yeah. is showing, this map actually is showing the amount of oil exploration sites in Egypt. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, if we look at this, um, these exploration sites, you'll find that any oil company will come, will say, okay, fine, Egypt, we are going to explore in your country for so much, and we are going to exped, spend so much money to develop this field. Yes. Now, this money they're going to spend is not charity. This money you're going to have to pay. So they would say, all right, fine, I'm remote from my area, so I will need to have a huge stock of spare parts. Now, we have here two sites. We have the land sites and we have the offshore sites. Yes. If you look at the offshore sites, mm -hmm. which are the more expensive, to operate. An offshore rig will have a downtime cost yeah. of between one and a half and two million dollars per day. So if something goes wrong, then you are losing one and a half to two million dollars per day. Now we're not talking about the rig only, we're talking about the rig, we're talking about the anchor handlings, uh, tugs that are around it, we're talking about the supply boats, we're talking about the diving support vessels. So it is a whole package that loses two million dollars per day if something no. goes wrong. Mm -hmm. So an oil exploration unit or an oil company will come and say, okay, Egypt, you're so far away, I, I need to have a lot of spare parts. Mm. These spare parts you pay for mm. as Egypt, number yes, one. Yes. Number two, these spare parts are idle capital. Yes. At the end of the day, again, coming out of your pocket as mm -hmm. Egypt. Mm -hmm. Now. If we look at the offshore units, we are talking about mainly ex the, the, the production of offshore components and spare parts comes from mainly two places in yes, Europe, yes. Stavanger mm -hmm. in or Aberdeen in Scotland. These are the two hubs for offshore exploration uh, equipment. Yeah. Steaming time between Stavanger or Aberdeen down to Egypt is between 18 and 21 days. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine 18 to 21 days, count the millions you are losing, per day, multiply by the distance, this is how much. If we are using the train, it is 72 hours. Mm -hmm. So we can tell the, Egyptian, the, the exploration company, hey, wait a minute, I don't need all this. I am going to use the train, I'll give you 72 hours. So you can only stock 72 hours spares, not 16 days or 21 days spares, which means less exposure for the Egyptians and more security for the foreigners for the exploration company. Mm -hmm. Now, we're talking about the land sites, not much, much reduced compared to offshore sites, but again, you have your main uh, producers of equipment. Mm -hmm. The principle is the same, mm -hmm. but the producer of equipment there is either in Antwerp or in Venice. Mm -hmm. Again, long steaming time. Yes. So this we avoid and we reduce. So there is a reduced cost. If we say, okay, fine, say XYZ company in Europe is going to spend five billion dollars. Twenty-five percent of that is going to be um, uh, spare parts, idle capital, which eventually you, Egypt, to have will have to pay.
no, thank you very much. We are not going to pay this amount because mm -hmm. we are going to guarantee you a transit time of any spare parts in a very much, much reduced uh, yes. period of time. Yes. So our exposure, our payback mm -hmm. will be much reduced. Yes. So these are the two items. Of course, there's plenty of other uh, commodities, like, for example, fashion. You know, a lot of uh, fashion houses have got uh, their their uh, fabrication uh, units here. Yes, they yes. they cut here, they sew here, and they do everything here. Instead of having to ship massive volumes, you can ship as they go along, mm -hmm. one piece at a time. Yes. So if you're going to be, say, supporting uh, the fashion is coming into Vienna first, then only the Vienna cargo goes in. Instead of having all the whole bulk coming in, piling up in a place like Southampton or piling up in a place like Antwerp and then having to be shipped back downwards. Again, reduce cost. Mm -hmm. you, are much, you are much quicker on the market. You are catching your season. Yes. And this is also another uh, step. There are many examples of this. Um, uh, much, uh, much more, of course, is the uh, imports of uh, sensitive equipment. And uh, I'll just leave sensitive equipment at that. Um, where we can have much more uh, privacy and much more uh, secrecy in our imports of spare parts and things like that, of rather than where we are exposed at the moment, having to ship on shipping lines, which normally go from uh, Egypt directly into other countries which are not really as friendly as we would like them to be. Yeah, okay. Uh, that sounds great, but uh, are we ready? <coughs> Uh, for all this with the, our infrastructure, are we ready for that or aren't we ready for that? How is it all integrated? I mean, yeah. getting along. The irony is that we are ready and I think we are more ready than anybody else. Uh -huh. We are more ready than the Arabian Gulf and we are more ready than the uh, Pakistan-China uh, economic uh, corridor. We have an extensive railway network. Okay, it might be old, it might be a bit uh, outdated, uh, there might be some damages here, some damages there, uh, but it's there. Mm -hmm. We have our own network. Mm -hmm. Our exposure financially to develop uh, a, a network like this is not really very big. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, it is a much lower exposure than any other country would have. If we create a railhead in Alexandria, and uh, which is already there actually on berth number 46 in Port Alexandria Port. Okay. And we have another railhead in Safaga, which is at the moment currently hooked to the bauxite terminal. If those two are developed, we can easily move a, um, we can move a, a train across Egypt inside 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Now, not just inside 24 hours, don't forget that we are also exporting some very sensitive equipment. A, uh, the aluminium um, um, uh, plant in Naga Hamadi yes. is not just importing, exporting aluminium ingots, it is exporting very fine aluminium sheets that are very sensitive, that are being used for printed circuits and being used for electronic equipment. Mm -hmm. And these sheets are very sensitive, they need very special handling, otherwise if you damage them, you spoil the whole circuit. So again, uh, use of a train there will be always very helpful. Also the sector between uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, yeah. we are talking about what, two million passengers every year. Mm. Now, if you operate a ferry, a rail ferry, that can carry passengers with sufficient capacity uh, at a very cheap price, I think we will be able to compensate. The, the price of the cargo will mm. compensate the price of the tickets. Mm -hmm. And you're talking here about a 24-hour steaming between Safaga and Port Abdullah or, uh, or, or Jeddah. If you talk to, Allah, to the other ports which are going to be coming to uh, next, <laughs> you're talking about five hours. So there is, there is a huge uh, potential mm -hmm. in that respect. Reduce costs passenger uh, capacity, which is going to be much enhanced and much easier. It will reduce also on the cost of air freight, especially after the, uh, the, the flotation of the pound mm -hmm. and how the dollar is behaving towards the pound. So we will be needing less dollars yes. to spend outside. Of course, then that will mean reduce the demand of the dollar. Of course. So maybe it would depress its, its prices a little bit. Um, 
Well, what, pro well, what prospects uh, <coughs> does that bring Egypt with all what we said again? Colossal. Colossal. An Englishman uh, in, a, uh, in an official meeting in London six months ago addressed a, uh, uh, an Egyptian official mm -hmm. by saying, you are talking about your uh, dust as gold. Yes. And by saying so, you are undermining your country. Your dust is diamond. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe in that. Yes. The prospects. This is wonderful. Your dust is diamond. Exactly. We do have, you know, like a lot, you know, to, to present, actually. Uh, the prospects. a city that will be used for shopping and for production of light mm -hmm. uh, commodities and so on on the Red Sea. And I would uh, say, Dr. Khaled, uh, I would like to go a step further yes. by saying use Halayeb Triangle. Mm -hmm. Halayeb Triangle is a dream triangle and I would like to change the name to Hong Kong of Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, the location of Halayeb Triangle, Halayeb Shalatin Triangle, will give you the access to the whole of Africa. Yes. So Europe can stock in Africa, China can stock in Africa, and they are only six hours steaming from King Abdullah port. So whatever commodities are coming for the Arabian Gulf can come across in six hours, fresh food, fresh mm -hmm. produce, mm -hmm. you name it, everything mm -hmm. from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Besides, Halai Triangle itself is a very rich, very, very rich area. Um, the Museum of Rome a few years ago have deciphered a papyrus, which they thought was an essay, but it turned out to be a map mm. showing the um, uh, gold uh, mines of the old uh, pharaohs uh, days. I think I don't know which dynasty I can't remember, but uh, they have been. Uh, there's so many of it that they have decided, oh, we don't need all that gold. Just bury it for the time being, but keep a map so we know where it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see uh, the prospects uh, of Halayeb uh, Shalatin Triangle becoming a new Hong Kong mm -hmm. in the West. Uh, as a dream that I have, if a link between Aswan and Halayeb becomes a reality, which is 600 kilometers of rail, uh, this area will develop very nicely into the new Hong Kong in the Middle East. And uh, the potential, actually, the sky is the limit. Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, with us online uh, Ms. Petha al Adi, <coughs> uh, shipping expert. Hello, sir. Hello. Mr. Kaji? Yeah, hello? Yes, hello, sir. Um, well, um, I don't know if we were with us you know, during uh, the session talking about uh, the great things that uh, the uh, um, Suez Canal actually with the uh, one belt, one road, and what can it can offer and what uh, it can uh, have actually and what we possess. Uh, as uh, Mr. Shreen uh, Nagar said, um, that, you know, uh, actually there is a dream, but then, you know, dreams come reality. And then also, you know, miracles uh, become reality. So how do you, how do you see uh, uh, the whole potential of the, uh, the area and the Suez Canal as a whole? I think the potential for, uh, for uh, especially for the shipping and the logistic industry is quite uh, huge. The, um, the idea that we have to set up uh, a strategy for uh, developing of the shipping and uh, logistic uh, development in the area, and not only in there, but in all around in, in Egypt, and, and that's in conformity with, uh, with Engineer Shireen uh, plans, which she has uh, just delivered. Uh, we have the hardware, which is the, the uh, roads, the bridges, the ports, the airports, so we have already the infrastructure. Uh, I can see that it's 
more or less ready for receiving more. Okay, let, let me ask the question. Then, you know, we have, every, we have everything. Why, you know, do, do we always, you know, like here, area, however, we have to, to develop, to do this. However, the, we, we need to, to have some software, which are the, uh, the regulations, which we have to go through with. And, and Again, the, the regulations, the, the law is uh, 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 ready, right? Regulations and laws? I'm sorry, the line is not so clear. Can you just raise yeah, the voice? Yeah, regulations, you know, like you pointed out that, you know, we need the regulations here. So, you know, I'm saying, you know, regulations, you know, like are, are, are missing and laws, like, you know, we do, you know, I have, you know, with investment, foreign direct investment, we need, of course, you know, like yeah, a pack actually, of... I, I, I see that we have prepared the, the infrastructure, but is that so far to my uh, seeing to, to the, the, uh, the whole thing that uh, there is... Um, no uh, strategy has been made for uh, for the software, which are the laws and the the whole uh, 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 laws and regulations which will regulate this uh, development. Uh, actually, also there is no synchronization between the different ministries and the different authorities, and there is no uh, general strategy for developing this. Uh, this, uh, this field, actually. I mean, for, just for instance, who is in charge for the logistic uh, strategy and uh, footprinting and everything? I mean, there is no answer for this question. Who is responsible for the logistics in Egypt? There is not a single authority who can think of the future of the logistic industry in Egypt. And that, you know, you cannot develop a strategy if you have nobody uh, is in charge of doing this strategy. And especially the, the logistics and the shipping, it's involving not only the Ministry of Transport, it's involving a lot of authorities and a lot of ministries are involved in, in, in this development. And without having a proper planning and a proper clear uh, uh, AEZ strategy, we, you cannot uh, attract investment in this field. So uh, it's rather uh, very important yes. to have a setup and have a general strategy for developing of this sector. Okay, uh, Mr. Bethat Lakhaji, thank you very much for being with us. And I'll find a final word because we have less one than one minute. Okay, uh, one, one final word is that I will uh, second uh, Engineer Methat's uh, comments completely. Yes. We are really suffering in this field uh, yes. because of the various authorities being uh, integrated in harmony with each other. As usual, no teamwork. Exactly, mm -hmm. and we need, we need an overhaul mm -hmm. uh, of the maritime transport industry in Egypt. Yes, yes. Now, the final dream I'd like to make is uh, if we are successful with what we are doing, and hopefully we are, mm -hmm. uh, who knows, maybe you can pick up the train in Cairo Station and after three days end up in Waterloo and <laughs> replacing yes. again the Orient Express that has been stopped after the Israelis uh, seized Palestine. Yes. This is another dream, of yes. course. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, a lot, you know, like we have to talk about, so we'll have, you know, like, uh, uh, well, just we go, you know, other uh, sessions to talk more about that, hopefully that something is, you know, happening, really, uh, and more cooperation between the authorities. Engineer Shirin Nagar, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, dreams always, uh, you know, we can just, you know, realize them. And uh, uh, still, I say, you know, that the age of miracles is not gone. We still, you know, like uh, always in you know, the miracles can become a truth. And uh, we Egyptians, I think we have the potential to do that. And we will be doing this. Uh, I'm Nermin Nazim signing off and leaving the grounds for my friend, uh, um, colleague, uh, Nermin Abdurrahman, with the latest in the stock market. God bless our Egypt. God bless our Egyptian army. God bless our president. God bless our Egyptian people. Electricity will receive offers from five companies to establish a coal-fueled power plant in Hammerwein by March next year.
The plant's production capacity is set at 6,000 megawatt per hour. Minister of Electricity Dr. Mohammed Shaker Al Marqabi said that the company signed a memoranda of understanding with the ministry in the past two years. These companies are of Chinese, Japanese, South Korean, and American origins. The Egyptian exchange EGX is expected to test the level of 11,574 points, which on passing it will confirm a rise where it is falling below, which will result in a mixed performance. The EGX 30 hit the resistance level of 11,650 points on Tuesday, then began profit taking and correction to close at 11,519 points. The recent gains on the EGX were primarily linked to the dollar's rise to 18 Egyptian pounds. Egypt plans further energy reductions, raising electricity prices from next summer after securing billions of dollars in funds from the IMF. Mohammed Sheker Al Marqabi, the Minister of Electricity, said in Abu Dhabi that the liberalization were sector. He said that they are moving to change the electricity tariff now, so definitely there will be some extra costs. The power sector is affected by the devaluation since all of the components of electricity are purchased in foreign currency such as equipment and fuel. The exchange rate of the USD EGP remained unchanged at the trades of the Egyptian banks. The US dollar offered at 17.6 Egyptian pounds to 18 Egyptian pounds, while both at 17 Egyptian pounds to 17.45. Earlier, the Egyptian Central Bank decided to liberalize the Egyptian pound against the US dollar in addition to raising the interest rate by 300 points. The Egyptian Agricultural Bank seeks to boost its deposits to reach 41 billion Egyptian pounds by the end of 2016. The lender also works on increasing its portfolio of loans by 2 billion Egyptian pounds to reach 25 billion Egyptian pounds by the end of 2016. The value of the bank's portfolio of small and medium projects stands currently at 14 billion Egyptian pounds but its management seeks to raise to 16 billion Egyptian pounds by the end of 2016. The government of Libya faces the threat of a forced devaluation of the country's currency and an end to fuel subsidies in a move that could spark a wave of popular anger and the fall of the teetering UN-backed administration in Tripoli. The credibility of Faisal Sarraj's government of the National Accord GNA is waning despite the support of the United States, France, Italy, 
and the United Kingdom, and its leadership has been unable to unite the country. Over the weekend, the Libyan dinar collapsed 7% against the U.S. dollar and for the first time was trading at 6 to the dollar on the black market. Prices rose to their height this month as a growing consensus emerged in the market that OPEC would overcome internal disputes and skepticism to strike a deal that materially reduces crude output. Brent crude oil futures, LCOC1, were up 22 cents a barrel, having earlier risen one US dollar in a push against the 50 US dollar mark for the first time since the end of October. U.S. West Texas Intermediate WTI crude futures CLC1 were up 14 cents at 48.38 U.S. dollar a barrel. Prices were boosted by comments from a Nigerian official attending an OPEC technical meeting, which is trying to hammer out details of a deal that it was likely all countries would be on board by the end of Tuesday. The annual U.S.-China Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade, GCCT, gets underway in Washington, D.C. The backdrop could hardly be more different from a year ago. In 2015, each side in the series of annual meetings that cover everything from agriculture to cybersecurity had its own policy advantages and policy continuity was the result of years of work by both sides. Just a year ago, enthusiasm for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, also remained strong with an official signing ceremony in Auckland, New Zealand, just months ago. World Stokes rode the slipstream of the first joint all-time high for Wall Street's four main markets since 1999, while oil prices hit their highest level since October. A powerful earthquake hitting the same part of Japan that suffered a nuclear disaster in 2011 nudged up the safe haven yen. The dollar slipped off a six-month high as the rally in oil and metal prices also drove up commodities-linked currencies such as the Australian dollar. Asia's top bourses had made solid gains overnight despite the clearest signal yet from American President-elect Donald Trump that will he will shake up the trade with the region. Stokes are benefiting from a belief that Trump spending policies will spur growth. Trade balance deficit rose by Tetan Jordan in the first nine months of 2016 compared to the same period last year. Total exports declined by 4% year-on-year and reached GOD 3.9 million in the nine-month period, while national exports decreased by 8.8% to GOD 3.2 million. Imports also went down by 8.1% compared to its level in the same period in 2015, as it reached more than 1 billion GOD. Trade balance is defined as the difference between the value of total exports and total imports during a specific period of time. Gold prices added 10 US dollars per ounce to 1,217 US dollars in Asian and London trade, recovering half of last week's 1.6% drop 
as government bonds also stemmed their post-Trump victory losses. India's surge of gold buyers after the government banned high-value bank notes to try and curb the country's black economy now face investigation and possible sanctions for tax evasion. Last week's near six-month lows in the gold price have induced some interest in the physical market. banks are trying to catch up with the rest of the world. After years of isolation left them with outdated practices, they are trying to fall in line with international standards of transparency so they can better attract business and integrate with the global industry. The central bank has instructed them to set up compliance departments and risk management programs. Businesses say the outmoded and opaque practices have created additional hurdles for foreign banks considering working with Iran after the nuclear accord. Major European banks are still wary of resuming business ties with the Islamic Republic for fear of running into remaining U.S. sanctions that apply to non-nuclear activities. Hello and welcome to your viewers, 11 p.m. in the Egyptian capital, Cairo, and you're watching Nile TV International. I'm Karim Gamaleddin, and I'll be bringing you the top news stories this hour. President Abdel Fattah Sisi met with Norwegian Foreign Minister Borja Branda on Saturday, during which they discussed means of cementing bilateral economic ties and expanding investments in Egypt. The two sides also reviewed the latest developments in a number of regional issues of mutual concern in the light of ongoing crises hitting the Middle East region. Pres presidential spokesman Ambassador Alaa Youssef said the president the distinguished ties that bind the two nations, adding that he was looking forward to expanding bilateral ties in various domains, especially in the maritime transportation and ports administration, as well as fishery and renewable energy. The head of state welcomed the expansion of many Norwegian companies of its investments in Egypt, stressing the significance of fostering bilateral ties in the economic and trade areas, as well as continuing consultation and coordination over regional and international issues of mutual concern. He referred to the Norwegian role towards Palestinian issues and its efforts to reconstruct Gaza. For his part, the Norwegian top diplomat praised the two countries' close and deep ties, stressing Egypt's strategic importance for Arab and European worlds. Moving on uh, to the headline as... Uh, on Saturday, President de Sisi held a meeting which was attended by Prime Minister Sharif Ismail, the governor of the Central Bank, and the ministers of Defense, Interior, Foreign Affairs, Finance, and Supply, in addition to the head of the Audit Authority. Presidential spokesman Ambassador Alaa Youssef said the meeting discussed procedures undertaken by the government to control prices and supply the domestic market with its need at moderate prices. The, government, the president gave his directives to intensify monitoring on commodity selling and distribution outlets. The meeting also followed up the developments of constructing new urban communities as well as factories and various governorates in the light of expanding Egypt's industrial base. Prime Minister Sharif Ismail held talks with Jordanian Interior Minister Salema Hamad in Cairo on Saturday. Cabinet spokesman Ashraf Sultan said the Premier hailed the deep 
that bind the two brotherly nations and called on expanding relations in various domains, especially in the security field. Sultan said that the Prime Minister welcomed all ideas presented by Jordan in the field of exchanging information and carrying out joint training programs that aim at raising the efficiency of security elements in the two countries. The Cabinet spokesman also said the meeting probed means of exchanging experiences to confront challenges and hardships in the Arab region, notably combating terrorism, drugs and crimes. The Jordanian minister said his country is keen to consolidate bilateral ties in all domains, hailing ongoing contacts between the two countries' interior ministers, as well as Egypt's pivotal role in combating terrorism, which in turn has a positive reflection in the whole region. Presidential Advisor for National Projects, Ibrahim Mahlab, headed Egypt's delegation to the 16th Francophone Summit being held in Madagascar. A number of French-speaking countries are participating in the summit titled Mutual Growth and Development. In his keynote speech, Madagascar's president called for, president, rather, called for an all-out political approach to deal with illegal